so glad to be here with you this morning. Are, have you had a good week? Yes. Are you ready to go home? Ah, no, yes. We have had a good week. And no, I don't, I don't think we're ready to go home. In fact, uh, I think many of us are like Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's like, Lord, can, can we just stay here a bit longer? Let's, let's build a tent and uh, one for you and Moses and Elijah. We're just, we're just going to hang out here for some time. And boy, that's what I would love to do. I'm just, as, as Bob is leading and you're all singing and we're singing and praising, I'm just like, Lord, um, man, this is a good place to be. And I hope you've been being rejuvenated and strengthened and encouraged this week. And uh, we're going to do a little more business this morning as we prepare to go home today. And so a little bit about myself for those that don't know me. So again, Father Drake McAllister. Um, I've been a part of the Bosco Conference since uh, 2007, so I've been coming for a lot of years. And uh, many of you knew me for many years while I was just uh, regular strength Drake. And then, then one day I appeared at the conference in 2019 as Deacon Drake. And then I appear back at this conference to the surprise of many as Father Drake. And um, it... And why that's a surprise to many is because I'm, I'm one of those rare married priests. So, ha, so oh, 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 I don't want to hear what he has to say. I'm out of here. Um, no. So I, uh, long story super short, uh, I've told the story many times over the years at the conference. Yeah, I didn't grow up in the Catholic Church, was a Protestant minister for 13 years, uh, California, a decade in Seattle, entered the church in Seattle, and... Um, in 2004, and it was such a profound gift. And when we came into the church, we pretty much knew saying yes to the Lord might mean just an end to ministry. And the Lord said, no, get equipped for future ministry, whatever that may be. And it wasn't until many years later that uh, I knocked on the door of the bishop and said, um, is it possible that I could qualify for the dispensation? So if, if some of you may or may not know that many times, it's most common, same within Anglican ministers. And I'm just hitting this up front because people usually have questions and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But, but maybe you've heard more like an Anglican priest who is outside the Catholic Church but never left the Catholic Church. Eventually uh, his heart gets changed and opened up and he wants to come into full communion and then he enters the Catholic Church. He can apply to receive a dispensation from the discipline of celibacy, not the doctrine. Doctrines don't change, disciplines can. And he's allowed to continue in that priesthood. So I'm one of those guys, and ever since the Second Vatican Council, Pope Paul VI got this started, Pope JP II expanded it, Pope Benedict XVI expanded it even further, and I wasn't Anglican, I was actually Pentecostal was my background, so they're letting anybody in these days, is what that means. <laughs> and, uh, um, but actually, that's, that's not the case. When, if you're Anglican or Episcopalian, it's super easy. I mean, well, it's just the process is pretty cut and dry. Every other, any other denomination it's a case-by-case -case basis that has to, has to be submitted on a one um, on a one-off case to Rome and personally approved by Rome. So it was about a ten-year journey from start to finish. Um, before the time I knocked on the uh, door of the bishop's um, bishop's residence and said, "Let me in," and uh, till the time that I finally reached ordination. And so, um, so yeah. So the last time I was here, I was just on the in my diaconate. So I'm, it's a joy to be here. And and I was ordained in December of. 2019, so that meant I was ordained, and then like two months later, it's like, bam, COVID, and it's me alone in the church celebrating Mass in my first year priesthood to a, an iPhone, <laughs> and, uh, and the mysterious myriads watching online. Uh, I do have a website that I don't really maintain and keep up, but I did put a little bit of this papal paper trail on, and I actually don't have it on the screen, but uh, it's, uh, it's just from John 17, Jesus's uh, prayer for unity, and the website is thattheymaybeone.org, thattheymaybeone.org. If you're curious to the papal paper trail on how the dispensation works, you can get a little info there. And uh, so I am married. I've got a fantastic mission-minded wife and who was in the trenches with me for many years in ministry, heading into our, the Catholic Church, and is still in the trenches with me in ministry. I'm the father of five daughters, so it's all girls all the time at my place, three out of college through Franciscan, and then two more at home. So I've got um, 
you know, the, 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 the 15 year old, she'll be 16 here this next week. And then the 12 year old and the, and the 16 year old's like, I get a text yesterday, dad. She doesn't have a phone, by the way, just in case you got parents that are sorting out. She actually doesn't have a phone to text on because we don't get phones in the home. All right, she's like, Dad, can you get a picture with Father Mike? <laughs> <laughs> a prophet has no honor in his hometown, I'm telling you. That is never more real for parents. <laughs> um, I was like, no, he's gone. I didn't even know he was gone. I was like, forget it. I'm not getting a selfie with Father Mike. Uh, no. But he was actually gone. So, one other fun thing about being a priest in Steubenville, and it's just so, so great to hear from so many people come from different places, um, that, uh, so at our parish, the Holy Family, we've got, we've got three deacons. And, and just because you're in Steubenville, strange things happen. So we've got three deacons, along with myself, we're all Protestant converts to the faith. Our three deacons also all have PhDs, you know, one in business, one as a theologian, and another in computer science, and two of them are black belts. Uh, so, you know, when it's like they say, guard the doors, you know, our deacons are ready, are ready to act. And um, so it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing place to be here, and it is even more amazing to get to serve you as you come year in and year out. And, uh, and it's really our joy as the Office of Catechetics and the Catechetical Institute. It's our joy and our privilege, absolutely, to serve you. So wh where have we been this week? Bishop Hine got us started with the kerygma and reminding us of these four fundamental aspects of the gospel and that we are ordered towards mission. We should be on mission. Father Mike then reminded us, what are those idols? What are those good things that we're turning into the ultimate things? He's putting his finger, and the Holy Spirit is putting his finger on things for us. Dr. Carol Brown invited us to a deeper trust in Jesus, and it takes more and more trust these days to be doing what God is calling us to do. And, and today I want to talk uh, a bit about the Eucharist, and really it's in the context of this Eucharistic revival. I want to talk a little bit about the current culture in which we live. And some of the things that the Lord is needing from us as we go home so that we can be more effective in what he's calling us to do. And I just want to read a, a scripture as we get started. And this has really been my prayer for the last many years as I was approaching priesthood. So let's pray with this together. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, open our hearts this morning to receive you, to receive you even in a more full and deep way, even as we prepare for the sacred liturgy to which we will worship. Draw us near in this moment. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts, open our ears. This is Paul to the Corinthians. When I came to you, brethren, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God in lofty words or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in much fear and trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And Heavenly Father, I pray as we have this final talk and as we enter the sacred liturgy that you would be making this a reality for us. Fill us with the Holy Spirit and the power of God that we might go home and have words to say that aren't just from us, but it's you, Lord, speaking through us that those we listen to, they're not resting in our wisdom, they're not trusting in us, but in, in you, Lord God. And Lord, you know we have to proclaim, we must open our mouth and teach and speak and preach, but Lord, we need you teaching, speaking, preaching through us. So come Holy Spirit in this moment now, 
begin to move our hearts for the things you want to do in us as we prepare to go home today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yes, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so a quick survey of the crowd. Who here is under 40? Let's see. Okay, under 40s. All right, over 40s? Uh, I think the over 40s are winning, but uh, I think the over 40s are winning. It means they're still doing it. In fact, I got to talk to a brother from, uh, where was it, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan? Uh, oh, I forget where, where, where he said he was. And uh, I said, what do you do? He says, I'm just retired. I get to serve the Lord, do whatever the church needs, and do some CCD. And I just, I just, I was almost in tears listening to him saying, thank you for not being done yet. Thank you for saying yes to the Lord until your very last moment. And so the reality is the world has changed around us. And often we hear people say, oh, the world is changing, the world is changing. We need to stop saying it is changing because it has in fact changed. The world you grew up in, if you're in the over 40s, is not present here anymore. And even the under 40s, You've seen and noticed it over the last 10, 15 years. The world has changed. So what do I mean? Well, I mean, you're never going to get an actual phone book again. Uh, you know, there's somebody out there right now going, man, I miss that phone book. You just flip to the page, go find the hair salon, go get my hair set, and it was just easy to find. You know, you can flip to Ace Hardware. There it is in the phone book call the number and talk to a person. Uh, yeah, you're never going to get a phone book again. That's never coming back. Uh, you're never going to get buttons in your car again. It's touch screens forever. You're just going to be like, oh, man, this is just ridiculous. Um, your kids are never going to know a time when they couldn't get instant answers to everything and anything. And they feel like geniuses because they can do that, right? I mean, when I was a kid and I wanted to spell the word hamster, it was like hamster. There's got to be a P in that word. Like you write it, like doesn't have that word doesn't have a p. In. Like Dad, how do you spell hamster? So what would he do? He would hand me a dictionary and say, "Look it up," and I'd be like, "Look it up." And I was like, well, because I had no other option. If Dad's not going to tell me, my smile like, get the dictionary, flip to it, get to the answer. Hand, oh man, there's no p in it. Okay. In fact, my 12 year old, my youngest, who is still mostly homeschooled, now she's still homeschooled. She tells her friends horror stories. One day, my dad made me look up the word in the dictionary. Can you believe it? That is not an exaggerated story. I did not make that up. She has actually shared that story. That's the kind of abuse we have in the McAllister household. <laughs> so, but today, what do we do? We, we've got this here. You want to learn how to spell hamster? Spell hamster. Hamster. H-A-M-S-T. There you go. And, and, and there's, there, there's no level of resistance to getting the information and no level of ability to keep the information. So we've got smarter phones and dumber kids these days, I think. Um, the threshold is, is, is low on so many things. But the, the world has changed. And in a more serious note, when we look at how the culture has changed around us, so things like the Internet, and we still get people talking about the internet as if it's a new thing. Like, oh, on that internet, you know, like, it's not a new thing. <laughs> it's not going away. This is the way the world operates now. One of our roller coaster parks here uh, nearby, you know, officially said, we're never taking cash again. It's credit only. You can't use any cash in the park. Social media is a reality. All of the ways that people communicate with one another and have the perception of friends, the perception of relationships, and instant access to everyone's immediate thought. Anybody who has watched kids use social media and texting, you just think, what a bad idea. Man, nobody when I was in junior high needed to know my instant thought in that irrational moment. We're like, stupid girl, Felicia, I can't believe she... Uh, you, you post it, it's like... No junior higher needs an outlet for unfiltered thoughts in the privacy of their own bedroom so they can communicate all their dysfunctions. Um, this is the reality, though. It's not going away. 
the reality that each person has in their pocket a device that connects them to the most vile, foul, evil, pornography, language, debauchery that I would have had to work really hard and be really sneaky as a kid to go find. And it's just right here. You could pull it up within two seconds. I could ask Siri to look for the same thing in every image, video of the most vile things are just right here. A, a culture doesn't stay the same with that kind of access. A culture doesn't cease to change with that kind of access. How else has, have things changed? We live in a time when you can change your gender, that this is a settled discussion. If you are biologically male, you can go get a surgery to become female and vice versa. June is Pride Month, and it's not about treating people with dignity because we're all in for that as Christians. Everyone gets treated with dignity and respect, period. We want to help all people, least of these, the most of these, and everybody in between. But Pride Month is about calling objectively good things that are objectively not good. And our culture has moved on that. Most recent Supreme Court justice in her confirmation hearing is asked, can you define what a woman is? And she says, no, I am not qualified to define what a woman is. And this is one who is going to sit on the highest court of the land and make decisions on consequential, life-altering things for our nation. And we realize in these moments, I, I think we've entered the rabbit hole. We live in a world now, if we say we want babies to live in the womb... It's called violence against women, and it is hate speech for wanting babies to live. It's, it's hostile. It could kill your career if you say men cannot get pregnant. And these are all recent stories you, you can pull up. I've got sources for all these that are just happening within the last several weeks because it's a constant conversation. I just talked to a friend yesterday who was teaching at, a, at a, a private school, not a Catholic school, but a, a private school. And in their diversity training, they were told explicitly, when you see a group of girls in the hall, don't say, hello, girls, because that's presuming their gender. You have to say something neutral like, hello, students, or something. This is common. This is not fringe. This is not just in some sectors. Some states now are just having... Open drug use of all kinds of drugs, even hard drugs, just open in public, in the streets, and not just on the edges of town. Uh, we don't live in a nation that is being governed by a Christian worldview anymore. The world has changed. And these things that I just went through, this is just the last 10 to 15 years that all of these things have really come to a head. And beyond that, there's been things that have been around for a long time that have really already transformed our culture. But things like, you can, you can tell we've set aside our Christian underpinnings a long time ago because if you're a teacher in the public school, you have not been able to publicly talk about Jesus as a public school teacher for a long time. That is a fast road to get fired. What that means is the government is openly and directly hostile to the Christian faith. And as long as you keep it in your building, we're happy for you to do your thing. But do not bring that into the public square. We live in the world where the prevailing reason of why we're here is scientific materialism. That nothing, nothing, managed to create everything. And along with that, the prevailing worldview of the day is atheistic evolution. That since nothing created everything, there is no reason for you to be here. You're here, but it's just biological accident. You don't need to be here. 
and our young are hearing that. You don't need to be here. You don't need to be you. There is nothing objectively good about who you are, what you are, why you are. And when they jump on the internet, they're happy to find lots of people that are willing to answer that question of what they should be, why they should be, and what their worth is or isn't. We need to stop saying the world is changing. It's, it's changed. The question is, have you changed? Have you changed? What do I mean by that? I'm not talking about have you become like the culture. You wouldn't be at the Bosco Conference if, if you were trying to be like the culture. There's a lot of other places you could be. Have you changed your methods? Have you changed your program? Have you changed how you were going about the ministry of the gospel to meet the needs of the present day, which was the chief purpose of the Second Vatican Council? We don't change the content. The content does not change. But how we engage with the culture absolutely must change. I'm here today as a Catholic because one day in Seattle, Washington, I turned on the radio and caught EWTN radio, which happened to be Catholic Answers. There was a new method and a way to engage the world and I stand here today as a priest because of that one show I turned on one day. What a random encounter, and I've never met any of those people in person. How have you changed? And what is God asking you this week? I know he's been putting his finger on some aspects of you and your program, saying when you go home, boy, don't go back to business as usual. So when I moved to Seattle years ago, before I was Catholic, and we were pastoring a church there, I knew Seattle was going to be a very relativistic city. And I wanted to get better equipped to have conversations in that city. So I bought a book on relativism and said, okay, I want to read up on this. How can I engage and understand the culture in which I live? And so when we finally established our church down there, we were in the University District of uh, Washington there next to the University of Washington. And every Friday night, we'd go out on the street and take clothes and food to some of the street teens that were there. There was kind of a trendy street teen population um, that they would, would come and hang out down there. And so we would go and, and do this social ministry and then have a chance to evangelize as we had opportunity. And so one night, this, um, this guy Brian came by, Brian the Buddhist. And, uh, and I'd been reading my, this book on relativism, so that I just made it my mission. I want to try and find as many people who don't think like me that I can have conversations with so that I can get better at articulating what needs to be articulated. So Brian the Buddhist came by, and he was intrigued by our social ministry. He was about 21, 22, sharp guy, studying Greek, reading the New Testament in Greek, but he's Buddhist. So he would come and help us in our clothes distribution and ministry to the kids. Every week he would come and help because he was drawn in by that. And then he and I would talk theology or philosophy or parenting or whatever while we're doing stuff. And so one night, you know, or, or as we would talk, he would be articulating, well, listen, you know, I do believe in reincarnation. You're going to die and then you're going to come back as something else. And, and then at another time we're talking and he said, yes, and I, and I believe that all roads lead to heaven. Listen, you know, it doesn't matter which path you pick, they all get there. So one night I looked at him and said, well, if all roads lead to heaven, why not choose Jesus and Christianity because you only have to go once? <laughs> and it was, it was the most surreal moment because you could just see, it just stopped for like a solid 20 seconds, which seemed like an eternity while the gears twisted in his head and he just realized my philosophical, philosophical and theological presuppositions have just been exploded. That those two things actually can't exist. Or if they do exist, that all roads lead to heaven, it doesn't matter. And he's, and we just kind of went on. He came back for another couple of weeks and then, and then stopped coming. But before he left, he gave me a book. It was called Living Buddha, Living Christ. And I don't know where he is today and what he's doing. But in there, he just wrote a really nice note saying, I really have appreciated getting to know you all. You are truly living the gospel. And thank you for befriending me. And it was just a beautiful, a beautiful note. My hope is some, something of that conversation settled in with him and, and stuck. But here's what I know. We can't keep doing business as usual. The Lord is needing us to change. Not the content, but how we're reaching 
the world in which we're living. As priests, man, we got to stop debating the seven-minute homily. Come on, people. I mean, you've got people that are surrounded in the world by six days and 23 hours a week, and they're going to come for one hour at Mass if it's a long Mass, and we're going to think seven minutes of preaching is enough to inform the mind, move the heart, and lead people to a response of faith that will change their life. That is not reasonable. That is not reasonable. Yeah, you're clapping because I'm talking about the priests. Let's talk about, let's talk about CCD. Uh, We've got to have a CCD that is evangelizing and not just taking kids through workbooks and actions, not that workbooks are bad, but that is engaging them where they are and leading them to responses of faith. Confirmation programs that aren't just running kids through the sacraments, but making a bold attempt to engage them with the Holy Spirit, that this becomes a transformative experience. Every now and then I run into a student here at the university that said, tell me about your conversion to the Lord. And they said, in my confirmation class, I met Jesus. I said, tell me more about that, because that's pretty rare. And it's so amazing when you see those that are willing to retool, upend, how can we do this? And as a church, we got to be people that aren't just growing spiritually fat by taking more and more in and never serving. we got to be people who are going to the margins, serving the least of these. So the culture in which we live, it's changed. Have we changed? Are we adapting? So millennials, Gen Zs, when you, when you break it down, and, and the ages are all fluid, and I'm not super into like pegging people in this particular generations, but... It's helpful for the sake of discussion. This is kind of your age ranges. And the reality is, this world today, 74% are going to get their news and information on their phones. And, and 60% or more, they don't want to read. They just want to watch a video. Just talk to me. Just tell me what I need to know. So what does this mean? This means that they're not reading your church bulletin. They don't care what's in your church bulletin. Um, that's the 40 and over crowd and probably really the 60 and over crowd maybe. I don't know. Now my wife's the reason bulletin. All right. So, and TikTok as a social media platform, boy, you want to know what is really impacting this Gen Z. It's the TikTok generation. And once COVID hit, TikTok increased 475%. 69% of Gen Z is on TikTok. And what is TikTok? For those of you, if you're not on TikTok, it's just what this young man here is doing. You can get a video, and it's, it is ultimate path of least resistance. Just get a stupid video, a funny video, a meaningful video, and you watch it until you're bored, and then when you're done, you swipe. And it's just next video, swipe, next video, swipe, next video. You can go to categories, animals, whatever, hot girls, whatever it is, you know, what people are looking for. Um, because they're not going there really to be edified. And there's really great things on there. There's good stuff, but there's loads of just foul stuff. Now, there's no porn on TikTok, thankfully, but, um, but it's just ultimate path of least resistance that is just giving kids a, a, a perception of joy, a perception of meaningfulness, and it's nothing but vapid. How do we take people from that to this. They get in front of the Blessed Sacrament, they're like, wait a minute, the picture hasn't changed. Uh, how do I swipe? It's, it's, it's the same thing for like the last 32 seconds. Like, well, no, we're going to spend an hour in that room. An hour? What the heck are we going to do for an hour? We're going to listen. To what? There's nothing happening here. How are we taking people to this? Eucharistic revival. How are we taking people here? And the reality is, all the over 40s, you're going to be in charge for the next 20 years. And you can't just complain that the world isn't the way it used to be. We've got to stop complaining. We've got to engage. And we're not going to be like the world, or we're not going to reach the world by being like the world. We're not going to just reach them by just doing more transient stuff that doesn't matter. We need to take them to the substance. That's the Eucharist. And most powerfully in the Mass. So I want to talk about three things briefly this morning. Purpose, problem, pathway, and then I want to have a prayer time. I should have put that on there as a fourth P. Purpose of this Eucharistic revival. 
a lot of the conversation here about this is reverence for the Eucharist, reverence for the Eucharist. Yes, we want more reverence for the Eucharist. We want greater attendance at Mass, more adoration. But none of that is the purpose of the Eucharistic Revival. The purpose of the Eucharistic Revival is mission. It's to engage with the world. When you go to the U.S. Bishop's site, here's what it says. What is the revival? To inspire, prepare the people of God to be formed, healed, converted, united, and sent out to a hurting and hungry world through a renewed encounter with Jesus in the Eucharist, the source and summit of our faith. Can I get an amen? All right, I'm looking for a little more. We got one more paragraph. All right. But this is what we're doing, to be sent out. Or what is the fruit of the re renewal. What is, once renewed, what should this fruit be? To form, inspire, and launch missionary disciples filled with the love of God and neighbor that comes from an encounter with Jesus in the Eucharist to the margins of the church and the world. Can I get an amen? amen. Yes, this is the purpose of the Eucharistic revival. What that means for us is that if we do not have a greater zeal for souls at the end of this revival, we will have missed the point. If all we do is have a better time gathering together in the building, we have missed the point. It's all about mission. It's all about mission. So how often do we get opportunities to have conversations with Maybe dissenting Catholics, maybe those that don't believe, maybe our Protestant brothers and sisters, maybe somebody who's not a Christian. Are we looking for those conversations? Are we reading up and being aware of the culture in which we live or the people you're serving? How many of you, I'm curious, have seen there's, a, I think it's on Netflix, a documentary, Social Dilemma? How many have seen that? All right, we need a lot more hands going up in the room. Write down Social Dilemma. If, you've, if you didn't raise your hand or somebody next to you didn't raise your hand, write it down for them, text it to them. And um, you need to go watch that because it's a really profound documentary on all the creators of the social media, Google and Facebook and uh, Twitter and all of these things. And the creators saying, we didn't fully realize what we were creating when we created it. And we realized we've kind of created a monster. And it's really balanced. And then none of them say we hate technology, but many of them are like, by the end of the documentary, they're like, we don't give our kids any of this stuff because it's bad news. And these are all like young, hip, cool, atheist, secular kind of people. Huh. You know, they're not like a bunch of church ladies just complaining about the internet. Um, these are the people who created it. Sorry, church ladies. Um, <laughs> you're really making things happen. You're making things happen. There's lots of things we need to be reading and keeping our pulse on the hand of culture. But most of all, we need that Holy Spirit-empowered encounter with what we're doing. So how, how have we changed? Have we changed? Are we changing? The purpose of this Eucharistic revival is mission. That's why it's here. So the problem, what has led to the need for this revival? Well, Fundamentally, it's a lack of understanding and personal conversion to Jesus and adherence to doctrine. Um, it's all of these pieces. When these things are lacking, there's no way people are going to have reverence for the Eucharist. And a lot of this came from this Pew Research study that said 31% of Catholics don't believe in the real presence of the Eucharist. <clears throat> and which is kind of like half true. <laughs> it's actually not as accurate of a stat as one might say. So when you look at the actual study, what you see is from weekly mass goers, from weekly mass goers, it's, a, it's over 60%. Now it's not 100%, so we wish it was more. <clears throat> but it's not 63% either. So there's a lot of work to be done. <clears throat> But it's not quite as bad as the study makes it sound. But this kind of put things on the radar and the bishops, amongst many other things, are saying, listen, we, we need to get back to focusing on the Eucharist and focusing on mission. Another challenge with this generation is it's often said they're low commitment. 
that they're not invested. Underachievers. You know, we live in the no contract generation. Everything, cancel any time. Um, but that's not really it. This generation, they're, they're not motivated by institutions. They're motivated by issues. They're not motivated by just things that are good for the sake of just simply being good because you tell me it's good. They're motivated by things that change things. They're not going to come to a deep understanding of the Eucharist because the church says so. But they're needing to come to a personal deep belief in the Lord. And I had some time back a young man in this age range coming in through RCA, and he got down to the end and, and stopped short of saying yes to the Lord in the church. And he says, I believe everything. I, I just don't want to be associated with the Catholic Church. And there was a real obstacle with the institution. And he was one of the most sincere, Jesus-loving, practical guys I'd ever met. And he's still going to make his way in. But he's having a slow landing. So how have we changed? Are we prepared to meet the needs of our day? We've got to help people grow in understanding in that personal conversion to Jesus so they can adhere to the teaching of the faith. So what's the pathway? Thanks be to God. The pathway forward is you. You're thinking, oh man, we're, we're, we're in a world of hurt now. <laughs> yeah, we are God's evangelization plan and it's a bad plan, right? We, we are it. We are it. If Jesus had submitted a business plan, you know, with the 12 disciples, reach the world, it would have been kicked out of business school. Like, this is a bad plan. But you're the answer. Namely, the catechist needs to be the one to teach, to proclaim. The vocation of a catechist is two things we hear from the directory of catechesis. To do what? Transmit the teaching and the content of the faith. And not just to transmit the content, lead them into the mysteries. Lead them into the mysteries. And what Father Mike said the other night is absolutely true. He said, he gets to go put on a little video and it looks really great and big and reaches lots of people. And he says, but what makes the difference is you, day in and day out, in the trenches, doing that one thing that nobody will ever know. Like the story Dr. Carol Brown told of Barbara Morgan's mother sitting down praying with her to be intentional about her faith. We don't even know Barbara Morgan's mother's name, but we're all here because of Barbara Morgan's mother. What a gift. So for us, the pathway is to teach. And I'll invite Bob if he's up, if he's nearby, make his way on up. It's for us to teach. And I just want to give you one scripture here. There's a lot more I'd like to say, but I want, I want to get to the time we can spend some time with the Lord here. 2 Timothy. This is our battle cry. And this is Paul to Timothy. I charge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead. Preach the word. Be urgent in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort. Be unfailing in patience and in teaching. Man, that sounds exhausting. Yes, and you know it's exhausting in season and out of season with patience. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but have itching ears that they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own likings and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. As for you, always be ready to endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. This is what the Lord is saying through the Apostle Paul to me and to you. We're going to go home from this conference and we're going to persevere. We're going to get back in and ask the question, Lord, what are you asking me to change? And, and you can do it and, and there is no shortcut. And you've been doing it, thanks be to God. And you're going to continue to do it and Jesus needs you to do it. And so, I want to pause on the teaching here. 
and want to go with this question. How is God asking you to change? You've been in workshops, general sessions, mass, adoration, and I know the Lord is putting something on your heart. And I want to lead us to just a, a prayer ministry time right now. And I want to give you two things I'm going to ask you to pray about. And I want you to write these things down. This isn't just, I just want to do this, man. I want this to be concrete and intentional when you go home. The first question is, Lord, what do I need to change in my program? Lord Jesus, what in my program do I need to surrender to you? What do I need to change in my program? What do I need to surrender to you? I'm going to take the next 60 seconds here. I just want to let you sit with the Holy Spirit and want you to reflect on this question and write down what the Lord has already been putting on your heart this week that you know you need to go home and do. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Second thing, I want you to take a moment and ask the Lord. And this is the more difficult thing. What do I need to change in my life? What do I need to surrender to the Lord in my life? I know the Lord, he, he has for me this week. And I know he's doing it for you. He's asking you to surrender something. I have no idea what that is. And I don't need to know because the Holy Spirit knows. But we're here this morning to make some commitments flowing out of this retreat we've been on. So let's take another 60 seconds and let's listen to the Holy Spirit. I want you to write down what the Holy Spirit is asking you to, not the world. It's easy to look at the world and say, this needs to change. He's asking us, what do I need to change? 